I bid you welcome. I welcome you to my house. Welcome to my house. Welcome to my home. Hello, horror hounds. Welcome to my horror house. Last night I went to see Halloween Kills and I need to get some things off my chest. I, there's no way I can avoid spoilers for this video. So if you haven't seen the movie, please come back and, and, and watch again. But mm, I have thoughts. I, <laughs> I'm so frustrated. I, I, I wasn't completely sold on Halloween 2018. And the night before, I watched it again in preparation for the new movie and had the best time with that movie that I have had to date. I made a peace, peace with uh, some of the things that, that niggled me, uh, managed uh, to shelve some of those concerns and enjoy the movie for, for, for what it did. I thought, OK, fine, great, plus it's, it's Halloween. There's a new Halloween movie coming out. I, I, I was all on board the Halloween train. Let's watch the new one the following day with this with this new not a love for Halloween 2018, but an acceptance for what it is and what it does. And right, let's continue that story. And it turns out that the continuation of that story is an absolute hot mess. One thing I will say before we dive in, a couple of things actually. First, this is, this is very clearly the middle part of a, a supposedly intended trilogy. It suffers absolutely from middle part-itis. And I will reserve absolute final judgment until I've seen Halloween ends and I can see what these quartet of films, Halloween 78, 2018, Halloween Kills and Halloween Ends, what they will look like as a whole. Because it, it might be that a really good Halloween Ends saves Halloween Kills and turns it into quite a messy, extreme, weird sort of interlude before we finish Laurie's story, in which case it could suddenly flip it. And in the context of all four movies, it, it might be an extreme gonzo bit of a let's just go crazy before we dial it back in and finish the story, in which case my appreciation for it might rise. There are loads of people out there at the moment, according to social media, who absolutely love this film, who are going nuts for it. People saying it's their second favourite Halloween movie of all time. And I can kind of see why it, it delivers to the cheap seats. It, it, is, it is a crowd pleaser. We're coming back to the cinemas and we're watching a movie that delivers lots of kills and lots of very gory and bloody kills. And for some people that will be enough and that will be as exciting a roller coaster as they need right now, and that's absolutely fine. If you love this movie, I'm not going to blast you for it. I get it. <clears throat> Just not me. Just not yet. So if you've seen the trailer, you'll know we pick up straight after uh, where Halloween 2018 ends, and firefighters, first responders go to the house where Michael is trapped. And he escapes, and you've you've seen a hint of it in the trailers. He he, he slaughters a load of uh, firefighters. I mean, many more in the film than um, you you see in the trailer. It's it's actually quite ludicrous. I'm not entirely sure that a group of firefighters faced with a burning building and seeing someone step out of it, even someone armed, would instantly tool up with their axes and rev up their angle grinder and stuff. And like, okay, we're fighting this guy to the death now as though that happens all the time. <laughs> Nevertheless, they fight, but kind of don't fight. Um, they sort of, in an old 70s Kung Fu fashion, sort of line up one at a time to be killed. And then Michael goes off and does his stuff. Then we flash back to 1978 and Haddonfield and, and Halloween that night from, from the John Carpenter movie. These sections are incredibly successful to me. The look and the feel of, of Halloween's, uh, the original movie, sort of seeps back in. Uh, they've recreated the original mask to, to absolute perfection, which leads me to ask why, why was no one able to uh, recreate the mask in Halloween 2, Halloween 4, 5, H2, all of the other sequels, this uh, looks at times, as though they were filming Nick Castle in, in 19, 
78. They have an astounding stand-in for Dr. Loomis, who has brief cameos in this movie. So much better than trying to uncanny valley CG Donald Pleasance's face on someone. Just get someone who, if you shoot them right and put shadows across their face right, uh, you'll go... I was double taking going, is that Donald Pleasant? How have they done that? That's clearly not CG because it doesn't look weird and CG. Uh, just find someone who really looks like Donald Pleasance. They haven't quite nailed the voice yet. I think no one's ever quite nailed and probably no one ever will Donald Pleasance's voice. They tried the voiceover route in, in, in H20 as well. They did it in Halloween 2018, the previous movie with Loomis's recordings. They do it now with some, some dubbed dialogue. It's good enough and it looks so much like him that I was just sold. There was part of me that wishes, can you can you just do this, more of this, a little bit like you did in Halloween 2018? Some, some, some more of this sort of Panavision, sort of widescreen stuff, evoking more of the, the, the spirit of the original rather than really going full Friday the 13th at times, but not, yeah, m m most of the film, it, it doesn't feel necessarily like a Michael Myers film. It doesn't feel like John Carpenter's ch chilling Halloween. It, it's just, it's just out and out. It, it, it's all out. And I think, <laughs> I, th I think that's what this new trilogy of films is going to become. And some people really love that. Some people want to see Michael Myers just fuck up a shitload of people uh, and they'll, they'll be happy and, and, and he does that. One of the things this movie really misses is all the negative space in the original. Can you remember when you wa watch the original, you're, you're, you're scanning the frame, where's the shape, where's he gonna, where's he gonna pop up? So much negative space all, all, all around. It doesn't happen in this movie. Maybe a couple of times there are little, little suggestions that, oh, he might pop out here or there, but it's never built upon. It's never more than a couple of seconds worth rather than sustained suspense, which is which is a real shame. After we've had the Haddonfield 78 flashback, we just start to bounce around plot threads like like a pinball in a pinball machine. There's, there's, there's Michael doing his stuff. There's Laurie at the hospital where she remains sidelined in, in her own sequel. Um, ironically, <laughs> in Haddonfield Memorial Hospital, exactly as she's sidelined in the original uh, Halloween 2. Nice little Easter egg for fans if they care. The um, uh, logo for Haddonfield Memorial Hospital, the sort of HMH logo, is intact, which always struck me... Uh, in hindsight, after the introduction of the the Cult of Thorn and the runes and stuff like that, always struck me as, mm, looks a little bit like a rune, doesn't it? And we bounce from there to uh, the what feels honestly like the main story of the film, which is Tommy Doyle all grown up now, the, this sort of loose band of survivors of Michael Myers. Tommy Doyle, uh, the original kid that... Uh, Laurie was babysitting, and Lindsay, the girl that she was babysitting at the night... Um, Marion, the nurse, Dr. Loomis's nurse, and uh, Lonnie, the kid that um, bullied Tommy as a kid in the, in the, in the first movie and who Dr. Loomis uh, scared, did a little trick or treat. Get your ass away from there, Lonnie. They have a, have a flashback to retcon in um, a confrontation that young Lonnie has with, with the younger Michael Myers as well. So there's this sort of loose band of survivors who... Tommy especially takes the lead and decides to, to whip up this mob crowd and turn Haddonfield into a murderous, rampaging mob. Evil dies tonight. Evil dies tonight. You will get sick of people chanting that. So you have these three plot strands plus flashbacks and none of them really ever meet until till perhaps, well, a couple of them meet just at the very end. And uh, the end of it... I just got the impression that there was this was a film that was absolutely marching on the spot, absolutely treading water for its entire runtime so that we could fill out a film's worth of stuff before we get to the final part. Really nothing of note 
ever happens. It does feel like a clearing of the decks for a final confrontation between Michael and Laurie, which drives me crazy anyway, and I'll get get to why. Um, there are there are deaths in it that you could say, well, this is this is this is a development. This is quite shocking, but uh, <laughs> but I'm not sure whether any of them will stick because one of the things that Halloween Kills does is it takes a death from the previous movie and goes, I mean, he wasn't he wasn't dead. Very badly injured, still alive, still alive by the end of the second movie, going to be in the third movie. So I'm not even sure that I can buy any of the deaths of, of some of the uh, major players in this, in this movie, until we get to the last one and, and know they're absolutely dead. There's a section, uh, it feels to me, where this movie goes fucking flashback crazy. And it seems to be really scared that everyone's going to forget the story and is going to uh, forget who everyone is and what, and what people did. They, they, they have bits where someone will say something and it will flash back to that happening in the previous fucking movie. Um, weirdly, for a film that recreates extra stuff from 1978 and uh, a, a timeline which has completely wiped out everything after Halloween 2, they take a short clip from Halloween 2... And, and use that as a flashback. A, a flashback as a character says, oh, and this happened. Well, here's, here's a clip showing it happen. It drives me fucking crazy. I, can, I understand why flashbacks w were used like that as part of cinematic language and, and recalls from previous films at a time when there was no uh, home video, where if, if you were going to watch movies, you had to go to the cinema to watch movies. Or a little bit later on, you had to be lucky enough for them to, to pop up on TV. You you weren't going to be able to box set or, 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 or marathon movies. So a movie had to, had to remind you of something that happened in a previous movie. In a world where clearly these films are being designed for us to watch original Halloween and then this new trilogy, back to back to back to back, to, to just flash back uh, in your middle film to a scene we would have seen maybe 90 minutes ago, if not less, is starting to get a little bit obnoxious <laughs> for me personally. I was sat there going, yeah, I know, I remember. I, I do remember. I watched the film last night. You don't have to remind me. It seems to me these days that it's a symptom of a film that is worried that it's not going to be able to get its message across, that it doesn't have the attention of its its audience, uh, which is really worrying. And I think that this this film really suffers from that sort of rattling heebie-jeebies. But the kills are plentiful and they are super violent. I mean, they're actually pretty nasty. <laughs> and it does make me... It does make me laugh that so many people take against Rob Zombie's Halloween movies when um, certainly Halloween 2018 and now Halloween Kills seems to be seems to be borrowing more and more and more from from that well. Um, yeah, there's a nod again to Halloween 3. There's, there's the three masks. We saw that in the last one. It's like, yes, fine, okay. Um... Laurie at the end even talks about what the true curse of Michael Myers is, and I never thought part six would get a name check in any other Halloween movie. It makes me wonder whether in, in, in Halloween Ends someone is going to be talking about Michael's resurrection. Why, sure, why not? We might as well even have Dangertainment playing on in the background at this point. I have to shout out the... Uh, special effects people, the makeup effects people, the uh, the wounds look horrible. And the reason they look horrible is they look really realistic. There, there are plentiful uh, stab and gunshot wounds, sort of pulsing blood out with the regularity of a, of a slowing heartbeat. Uh, there are broken bones. There's, I mean, there's all sorts of murder and mayhem inflicted upon the human body throughout this film. And the the effects people went above and beyond. In that regard, if you want to watch it as a gore hound, it, it absolutely delivers. I do scratch my head and question, uh, are, are Halloween movies gore hound movies? And I, I, 
It depends how much of a purist you want to be. It, uh, everything from, uh, I mean, John Carpenter famously upped the gore and explicit quotient from Halloween 2 onwards, uh, you know, uh, uh, against the, the, the cut of the uh, director of, uh, of Halloween 2 because of the effect of films like Friday the 13th and the like. So maybe I need to get off this pedestal. There are far, 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 far more explicit Halloween uh, kill body count movies than there are uh, not, which is just the one, the original, but um, David Gordon Green made such a big deal of clearing the decks and we're only taking the original and we're moving from there. It seems it seems strange to go to all the trouble to do that and then with your second film just go, we're going straight back to body count, uh, high gore, uh, high kill, and what's your purpose? What's your, what's your mission statement? Are you honouring the new one or are you just... I, I just... It scrambles my brain a little to know what the point is beyond saying we've got three movies now and having to have, therefore, a middle movie. There is one section that, that shows you perhaps what could have could have been. There's an, uh, an attack by Michael, almost called him Jason, because it's so close to a Friday the 13th film. Michael attacks a small group of these mobs split off and go around the town and he attacks um, uh, a group that, that has um, a grown-up Lindsay. Uh, was it, is it Lindsay Wallace? Um, and she runs off and Michael begins to stalk her and all the music and all the loud whiz-bangs all stop. And it's just her running and heavy breathing and Michael following and his heavy breathing behind the mask and then she hides and she's... she's trying not to make a noise and he's looking around and it's just his breathing and then playing cat and mouse in the shadows and I thought this is it this is it this is this is the legacy of Halloween this is this is the sequel to Halloween and then after that it goes it goes mad all over again no one can fire a gun to save their life um so many people have beads on my gun. I mean in, in just before that Lindsay chase scene um it's all contained in and around a car and there is a, there is an armed character who is just there and she she disappears from from the set piece and then reappears at the end after multiple 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 opportunities to just put a bullet in the back of michael's head and she kind of reappears back out of nowhere firing wildly no one can use a gun i suppose that's quite realistic the problem for me is that the the the, the, the mob storyline, the mob mentality, the vigilante justice, it it was done in in Halloween Four, and it was done really effectively in Halloween Four, and an innocent bystander gets shot because loads of people go off drunk and half cocked uh, with their vans and and their guns, and that's done, and they do the same thing here, which culminates weirdly in a sort of quasimodo. Hunchback of Notre Dame style scene. And I know this film was filmed uh, before the January the 6th storming of the Capitol building in Washington. It's so hard to watch those scenes and not think of it. The messaging of what we're seeing in this movie is so absolutely muddled that I really don't know what the film is. If anything is is trying to say about mob justice and vigilante justice, you have two of our nominal heroes in the film, Tommy and Laurie, whipping up this crowd and saying, "This this is the only way we can do it. We have to. We essentially we have to mob rule now. Execute Michael Myers." Um, Laurie is saying that um, the system doesn't work, and then. About five minutes later, she's screaming at the mob she helped to whip up and screaming at them and calling them sheep and saying that they're just... <laughs> this, this this mob that I've whipped up into a frenzy, it's acting like a frenzied mob. Someone who is not Michael gets killed and Tommy Doyle's reaction to, to, to what he has instigated was, yeah, I, I fucked up, but um, the only thing I can do is keep going. <laughs> it, I was sitting there thinking, is this the first MAGA horror movie? One of the things that I liked, which it made explicit, which is something that rankled me from the first movie, a couple of times, the characters say to Laurie, Michael wasn't coming back for you. 
Dr. Sartain literally had to put him in a car and drive him to your house. That was something that really rankled me with uh, with with the previous movie. All, all all this talk of he's been waiting he's been waiting forty years to come back and get me. And 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 in the film, Michael didn't give a fig for Laurie Strode. I love the fact that in this movie, uh, characters actually tell her she spends the entire film going, "He's coming! He's coming to the hospital! He's coming for me!" You don't need to go go out <laughs> to, to Adamville and search for him. He he's going to come here. And characters tell her. He doesn't care about you. He was never looking for you. That's not what, what he's about. And then uh, they lose all of that goodwill at the end with, with an ending that is just so. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm slightly gobsmacked by, by how little sense it, it, it makes. Uh, the mob and Michael meet. They, they, kind of, they kind of have to. Some of these plot strands have to, have to meet at the end. So please, God, some of them have to. And uh, the mob surround Michael and beat him uh, and shoot him and stab him to death. No one is getting up from that. It is beyond me since since I've, I've watched the movie, read interviews with the director, where in being asked about that ending, he's saying in print and in interviews that he still believes that Michael Myers is, is a flesh and blood man. Uh, and yet he's down, he's dead. Then we get some absolutely Bonkers, hand wavy, uh, voiceover, mystical hoodoo from Laurie about how, uh, and you'll have seen it in the trailer. The more he kills, the more he ascends. It's fear that feeds him. Brute force can't stop him, and, and stuff like that. It's almost as if her fucking insane rambling, which doesn't make any sense. She says, "Wherever people are afraid, there's the boogeyman. He's, he's more than he's more than a man." It's almost as if this this weird fucking nonsense actually brings him back and, and he gets back up and he kills everyone and then he's just alive at the end and the reason he's just alive at the end seems only to be because we need him alive at the end because we've got one more movie to tell it's absolute fucking nonsense it plays very 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 close Sales far too close for my liking to the idea that he's now a supernatural entity. I know it was always alluded to. It's alluded to in the first film. Lumi shoots him six times and he still gets up uh, and, and walks away. But it's sort of played out, hinted. Did, did Loomis really shoot him six times? Did it, did it really go down like that? Has he really just walked around this corner and disappeared? And... I don't know how they can dial back from that. And what they're saying is that uh, the, the final movie is going to be a more personal affair. It's clearly set up to be Laurie versus Michael. Laurie's off the fucking deep end saying, maybe I'm the only one who can kill him. Maybe I have to die for it to end. She's, she's still in this fucking egocentric, it's, it's all about me land. Uh, even though people have told her... Um, it's, it's got absolutely nothing to do with you. Michael doesn't care about you. She's off in cloud fucking cuckoo land uh, about her importance to this whole thing. And I've got a horrible feeling that the final film is going to play out as if she was right all along when she is just as obsessed and delusional as Michael is. I hope to be proven wrong. I hope that Halloween ends can stick the landing and I can sit down at some point and watch all four films and the third film will just be a... Right... Everyone, let's just go nuts. Let's spray everything with blood. And then after 90 minutes, we can take a deep breath, settle down and finish off this story. Okay? Because that would be quite fun. As, as it is now, this film is utter nonsense. Look, this, this, this mob that I've whipped up into a frenzy, it's acting like a frenzied mob.